Well, I do hope you're in the celebrating mood. We certainly are. Hey, you know what? These glasses work a little bit better than those <laughs> other. Yeah, they don't look yeah. as good, though. I yeah. You looked pretty snotty, like a little bit like a superhero, I thought. Well, I felt like a superhero. And Maggie guys, with the glasses of love. Of course. But guys, glasses. can you believe it? 2020 is just a few hours away. I know. Like, this is crazy. It's the yeah. end of a decade. It's not just the end of the year. Yes. And we've had a great year here on 100 Huntley Street. Have, we've yeah. been able to uh, interview some great people, some great guests kind of peek behind the curtain of fame and, and really hear the motivation of why people do what they do. Yeah, you know, and we want to be an inspiration during this program. So we've talked to some celebrity friends. And Cheryl, you did a little bit of traveling, got to meet some cool folks out there. Yes, headed to Nashville. I got to speak with Tasha Layton about her music journey and how it all began with American Idol. You know, TV, I mean, you work in television. It's, um, it's just its own world. I mean the world of cameras and lights and sets and all that stuff. And I think having only sang in the church my whole life and, and being in that situation, it was so weird. <laughs> like it was so weird on some levels, but it was also um, felt natural in a weird way. No one else in this world comes close to you. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I got a thing for you and I'm not playing, yeah. I said, baby, 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 do you really love me? And so baby, baby, when, um, when I ended up be being on the show, I just was kind of having fun and like, okay, here we go. <laughs> Let's do this. Um, I felt a little bit at a disadvantage because I had only ever sang or listened to Christian music. So... A lot of the songs that people were learning and singing for the show, I didn't know. So I felt like I was on this huge learning curve the whole week. And um, my stressor is always remembering lyrics. So I'll, I will always write like the first line of a, of a lyric on my hand to remind myself. I don't do that anymore. But um, I used to do that a lot. I would get really nervous. But yeah, American Idol was crazy ride. And... Um, you know, that they're interested in making good television. So sometimes it's not as much about talent as just kind of um, does a person possess star quality or drama. Good story. Yeah, a good story for TV. Yeah. But out of that, you were found by a talent agent. You got asked to tour with Katy Perry. Yeah, so um, it's, it's an interesting story, but I actually got a job singing for the Kesha Rihanna tour. And the morning of, I just woke up and thought, I don't think I'm supposed to do this. That still small voice of God. And I called them at 11. I was supposed to be there at 2 p.m. I called them at 11 and said, you know, I don't think this is right for me. And when I got off the phone, I thought, oh my gosh, I've just self-sabotaged. I have uh, ruined my opportunity. But I, I couldn't, I've gone against the voice of God enough in life to know not to do that. And so I couldn't go against that still small voice. And then at 2 p.m., the same time I was supposed to be, you know, starting rehearsal with them, I get a call from Katy Perry's manager. And I was like, how did they even find me? You know, how did they find my number, all that stuff? And I downloaded the song on my phone and I learned it on the way. And um, I left for Madison Square Garden two days later with Katy and was on the road with her for years. So. It was definitely a wild ride and, um, you know, not reality for most people, you know, like nice hotels and private planes and all that. That's just not real life. And it's like a dream. So, but like anything, you get used to it. And at the end of the day, it's, it's not fulfilling. Like it wasn't fulfilling for me anymore to be on the road with her. I learned everything I felt like I was to learn and um, I'd poured out everything I felt like I could pour out. And at the end of the day, I just missed singing songs that directly connected people to God. And I was in Africa on a missions trip and meeting up with the tour in Malaysia. And when we landed, um, just returning to that world, I just felt the dichotomy and I couldn't reconcile it anymore. And I thought, you know what, this season is done. It's been amazing. And it's paid for a lot of missions trips, <laughs> but, um, but it's time. And so that's when I made the transition to Nashville and started writing music. 
You know, Natasha's story is one that we see a lot of people being discovered in, in social media and reality TV in weird ways these days. But I love what Tasha said, it just like rediscovering who Jesus is through, you know, dabbling in all of these other areas, but just rediscovering who he is to her. And I love it, the fact that she in that small, still small voice that, you know, she made a decision. And, you know, I think the thing is too, we realize that a lot of these people that are involved in the entertainment business, they're under a lot of pressure. Yeah. And she seemed like a real down-to-earth kind of girl. She was wonderful. And I, I so relate to her when she said she got off the plane from Africa. I know both of you know what this feels like. Just at, to, come, to come back to normal life from being in, in a situation of extreme poverty and, and just to come back to, to my just everyday life is shocking. But to come back to the life she was living with Katy Perry, I'm sure that that contrast was so shocking to her and caused her to make a really big decision, which ultimately I think is benefiting her. Mm -hmm. yeah. She's launching a great music career. Well, another memorable guest from this year went viral with his own spoof of millennials. Here's an excerpt of that. So someone's watching and they're in the midst of that struggle right yeah. now and just struggling to trust and obey, as he said. What would you, what would you say to them? It is very easy to feel like that we know how this thing needs to end, mm. okay? It's, I mean, like for me, it's like, I want my brother to be healed. Mm -hmm. And if you asked me, do you want to wait a year and see this chemo tear his body apart mm -hmm. and those things, and like just see the things that he went through? Um, or do you want to wait 10 months mm -hmm. before someone can come into your house and actually fix it? You know, I would go, no, I don't, I don't want that. But if you ask me, um, do you want to see the Lord's faithfulness in his timing? Mm -hmm. um, if I get to see his faithfulness in the end, that's a victory for my life. So I think that we can't get so caught up in the instant. We live in a world where instant gratification is so accessible. We can pull our phones out and can connect with anybody over the place, but we get lonely sometimes mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, and I just say to that person who feels like they're isolated and lonely, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Jesus draws nearer to us than a brother. Um, he is where our help comes from. Mm -hmm. And he is, and it may not come in the way that we want it to, but if there's something that the Lord wants to teach our hearts in trusting and obeying daily, mm -hmm. Don't get so caught up in tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough of its own things. Mm -hmm. Don't rely on things from yesterday, except for the trust that he's built inside of us to know who he is. Trust that today he knows what he's doing and that your job is to look down to be faithful to the things in front of you and let him be God and let you be the one who gets to see how God moves. Oh, such wise words. It's yeah. one of the things I actually love about interviewing musicians because a lot of them are writers and they're, they're very deep. Yeah. Right? And they have so much lived wisdom. You, you see it in their songs, but then when you talk to them about the story behind their songs, I just find it so incredibly powerful. And what he said is, feel all alone, you're not alone. And that, that trust, man, it is, a cho it is a choice sometimes when you're going through a really hard time. Like I have to say to myself, no, I am choosing to keep my eyes on mm -hmm. you. I am choosing to trust you today. I cannot do this alone. And as we look toward a new year, some people are saying bye-bye 2019. <laughs> so long. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you, you look to a new year, you don't know what it holds. The only way that we can go forward with courage and joy in life is to say, I'm never going to be alone, God. You know the future and you have it in your hands. Yeah, I loved spending some time with Micah because his story is so full of faith, you know, leaving his career behind, you know, selling sausages while he was, you know, trying to become a musician and just really trusting God in some of the darkest moments where he didn't see him answering. And now he gets to open up for some of the biggest acts in the world and he gets to sing his music. It just shows God's faithfulness. He's amazing. And I know my youngest daughter, Amelia, uh, actually, she wrote uh, a poem and then asked Micah, people if she could use his music and they agreed mm. to it and uh, so we just have a real special cool. place in our heart for him. One of the things that we you know we talk a lot about here is legacy mm. certainly David Maines you know the founder of 100 Huntley Street. Well Grammy Award winning musician Stephen Curtis Chapman 18 studio albums. I mean this guy is a machine. He is amazing and his uh, second in the genre of bluegrass but you know what really makes this special mm. is his dad was involved in the project. They did the classic I'd rather have Jesus. Yeah, well, that song um, was sung at my grandmother's funeral, my dad's mom, who raised my dad and his brother alone. My dad's father uh, was not in the picture, left home when my dad was three and died a few years after. So uh, my grandmother just is such a powerful presence in our family and loved Jesus and uh, was a praying grandma. and. So when she passed, we, we sang that at her funeral. It was one of her favorite 
old, you know, gospel songs and, and as a result one of my, my dad's. But the words are also so significant because the words talk about how I'd rather have Jesus than wealth or fame. And my dad, who had been pursuing a career in music and country music and folk music, when he really gave his life to the Lord, he laid that dream down because he knew it would mean he wouldn't be able to be there for his sons and be involved in his family. And so the reason I have a love for music and a relationship with Jesus is much due to my dad making the decision to lay that dream down and kind of that sacrifice of that. But then to be able to sing that with his sons and actually end up singing on the Grand Ole Opry and doing a lot of really amazing things together uh, with my dad has really been special. And that song kind of sums all of that up. So we put it at the end of the album. I told my dad I wanted him to sing it. And uh, he said, son, I don't think I can get through that because I cry when I try to sing that song. Mm -hmm. And so it took us about 12 takes. Um, those that were in the studio, remember, because we had cameras rolling and everything, and he'd get one line out. He'd sing, I'd rather have Jesus. And then his head would go down. He'd just get real quiet. And he'd look up and he'd have tears. And he'd say, I just don't know if I can get through this one. This is, you know, it's so powerful. And then I'd say, Dad, it's okay. Just, we'll try again. If you can't, it's all right. But do you want to try it again? Yeah, I'll try it again. You know, he'd get another line out, you know, and then he'd put his head down. But we finally got through the song. <laughs> and it's really, really special for me if, you know, if the whole record was just for me to have my dad singing that song, because, you know, I know he won't be with us forever. I mean, he's 80 years old. He's already had some health, health issues. So very, very special. What a great memory. Yeah. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. And I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. Okay, I can't hold the tears. That is just so beautiful, the love between a son and a father, and you can kind of see why Stephen Curtis Chapman turned out to be such an amazing guy. By the way, the name of the album is Deeper Roots, Where the Blue Grass Grows. Uh, what, the album. what an amazing thing how his dad laid down his career, and then it comes full circle yeah. where he gets to sing with his son this beautiful song of faith. And I love the fact, like, the, the words to that song, right? I'd rather have Jesus and silver or gold, like, and fame, all of those things that Jesus is first and his dad feels it so deep that he can't hold in the tears, he can't even get it out. Man, that, what a legacy Stephen Curtis Chapman has in his dad. Yeah. And I just think as we end 2019, maybe that's a good challenge for us. Like, would we rather have Jesus than anything else in the world? And as you start, you know, 2020 is just a couple hours away. I hope you are you're just thinking about that how does how does my relationship with Jesus interact with how I see him maybe I need to you know think more about that relationship maybe I need to be challenged with that always remember our prayer lines are always there even tonight one 273 4444